Welcome to Explain the Bible, where we explain the Bible. This is Daniel Jepson. Sometimes I'm joined by Nathan Beasley. We have two other podcasts you might want to check out, Philosophy and Faith and Pretty Good Sermons. Links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the next phrase we're exploring is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is God's kingdom and what is God's will? And then we'll look at what what does it look like for God's will to be carried out on earth as it is in heaven? So let's just start with that question. What is God's kingdom? Yeah, that's a very good question and it's difficult to give a short answer, but basically... It is the idea that God will bring about upon this earth a kingdom full of his glory and justice and love and beauty, and that we can be part of that kingdom. That's beautiful. So what's the interaction between his kingdom and his will? And why should we pray that his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Sure. So those two phrases go together. I think what we see here is that Jesus is describing the nature of the kingdom from one perspective. Right now in heaven, he says, so in the heavenly realms, the ones that transcend this world, his will is already being done. Hmm. So it's implying that in that realm, at least in the part of it that he is talking about here, God's will is being done without hindrance, without problem, and it's reaching its full perfection. But not here yet on this earth because this world is not yet full of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come, at least partly, in Jesus. So it's here in seed form. It has begun. It has sprouted. Uh, It is not here yet in its fullness. What you have, though, when you see the seed and the seedling is evidence that that plant is real and is growing, and it will one day reach fruition. Yeah, I love there's a line that John Stott uses in talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God in which he says that it's an already not yet kingdom. It's tasted now, but consumed later. Yeah, And it's beautiful to see the ways we we see God's will revealed in scripture. And it's beautiful to see the ways that there is kind of a foreshadowing. Anything that's good and beautiful and right foreshadows the way in which that becomes Mm -hmm. fulfilled in, in the future. But it's nice that he teaches us to pray like this. So what does it look like for God's will to be carried out on earth as it is in heaven. Interesting, isn't it, that the way that we see the kingdom brought more and more into this world is through prayer. Hmm. I suppose you could say that's not the only way, but it's the way that's talked about here. We pray for the kingdom to come. And in line with that, then, I think it's very clear that that next line is parallel to that, your will to be done here on earth, as it's already being done in heaven. I view that as fleshing out what it means to pray that God's kingdom comes here upon earth. And there's a, a tension here, there's a mystery here. Because in one sense, the timing when Christ comes back and fully establishes that kingdom is set by God's will and determination. And yet, his will and determination apparently also include human prayers and activities, including aligning our will with his. So first we align our will with his through prayer, and then our will becomes his will. And as it does, out of that flow fruit, which is in accordance with his will, and now our will, which is perpetually more aligned with his will. And so we we actually partner with him in bringing about his will on earth as it is in heaven through our prayer and then our works here on earth. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's a good way to summarize that. It's aligning my will with his. I think you have the right idea there. It's not canceling my will. It's not doing away with my will. But it's saying, God, in in the deepest part of me, I want your good purposes in this world and in the world that I touch, the things that affect me. I want them to be the way that you want them to be. And I want you to let me be part of that, to join my will with yours. It's not so much that God overrides our wills. Uh, if that was his goal, he would have never made his free will in the first place. Yeah. But rather, when a husband and wife say come together in a joint project and their wills are one, 
and the way that they work within that is a, is going to be different. We still have our own distinct will, and yet it's towards a greater goal. I can see how this flows very naturally from the first petition, which is, hallowed be your name. Yeah, it sure does. Because when I see that God is my father, and that a father implies a person who loves me, but also has a will and a purpose. And when I'm getting the idea that for his name to be hallowed means to see the glory of who he is, well, very naturally then, I desire my will to be conformed to his. Yeah, yeah. And this also seems to be a transition piece into the next one, where yes. once we have requested that our will is bent towards his will, then as we request daily bread and as we confess and as we forgive and these kinds of things, we hope that those are in more accordance with his will. Exactly. Without these first three initial phrases of the Lord's Prayer, we are not going to be asking in the right way for our daily bread or for the other things involved. It will be self-centered and self-focused instead of more holistically God-focused and therefore rightfully focused. And, I, and again, I hasten to, to add, this doesn't mean that we don't have a will or that we're just robots of God or anything. Sometimes analogies help here. You have a nine-month-old baby right now, mm -hmm. and there'll get to be a time where he is able to understand that his will and your will are not the same thing, right? Right. <laughs> Unfortunately. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens then? Well, he has to make a choice, and... Hopefully, he is smart enough to realize when he's, say, three or four or five years old, all right, my mother and dad love me. Yeah. And they also know a lot more about how life should work than I do. <laughs> so I'm going to respond to them, not with rebellion, but responding to them with trust and obeying them. Now, that doesn't mean that child doesn't have a will. It just means that in its various stages, that will is in cooperation with yours. Say when he's seven years old and you've got a fenced backyard, and he says, you know, can I go out in the backyard and play? And, you know, Abby says, sure, we have an hour for dinner. Go out in the backyard and play. Now, does that mean that she's going to tell him everything to do while he's in the backyard? No. She sets the boundaries according to his maturity, his age, and the dangers of the world around him. But she doesn't care if he digs in the dirt or plays with his trucks or whatever. Yeah. And what I mean by all this is when we submit our wills to God, it's not this freedom that's taken away from us, but in a sense, it's freedom fulfilled. Because then we are able to do what we are wired and created and loved to do within these greater boundaries of God. Yeah, I love that. And I love how there's this idea that obedience becomes a good gift because it's in the boundaries that are set by a good and loving father. Yeah. And so trusting that he has good intentions for us and good love for us, then acting and living and, and conforming to his will actually is a good way to live sure. and, and a good way to pray. So this is, <laughs> at first one might look at this one, okay, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, beginning with me in my heart and moving through me as that transforms me in the world as something that takes away the will. But I, I love that you said, no, it doesn't. It doesn't take away our own will, but it allows us to conform our own will to something that's greater. Yeah. And, and maybe think of another analogy just to kind of flush this out because usually one analogy has its limitations, right? So who's who in your mind is the greatest basketball player who's ever lived? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> going to go with MJ? Uh, well, I know it's a hot button issue, but sure, let's go with MJ. All right. And yet he had to listen to his coach, right? True. So his coach had a broader perspective than he did as an individual. He understood things in a broader way, not because he was smarter, but because that was his position in place. But that didn't mean that Michael Jordan, even though he was following the will of his coach for the team to work in a certain way, to follow a certain type of offense, that he didn't have any freedom about where and when to shoot or what moves to make or how to, how to make things happen. It was only when he really melded his will with his coach that he was able to attain the greatness that he was able to do. In the same way, God's not interested in quashing our will, but he recognizes that we don't see the broad picture. We don't see the big picture. We don't see all the issues involved. 
Yeah, including spiritual forces that we really don't have much understanding of at all, but affect us. But he does. So it's as we work within his will that we are the most productive in our own decision making and in our own desires. Yeah, that's a really good, that's another really good analogy. I like that his, his coach, Michael Jordan's coach, and most good coaches are not in the business of micromanagement. Right. But once they give you a perspective and offer some help in how to perform to the best of your ability, and that's the other thing, is that the coach's interest was helping Michael Jordan be the best athlete that he could be. Right. And their wills were aligned. They their both, wills were aligned. They both wanted to win the championship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I think that that's a good, good illustration for God because he loves us. He has goodwill towards us, uh-huh. that he wants us to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. And, and that means aligning our wills to his. And within that, then we have the ability to act with creativity and truth and justice in the ways that are good, not only for us, but for the rest of the world. Exactly. So that's what I understand this phrase to mean. It is intentionally recognizing that God's will and God's ways are better than mine, that he sees things that I do not even begin to understand. And therefore, I'm aligning my will with his, saying, let your will be done on earth, especially in the areas that I have any effect or control on, just as they're already being done in heaven, so that your great kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of beauty and truth and righteousness and justice, more and more comes upon this earth. That's what this prayer is about. Hey, thanks for listening. Hit the subscribe button if you want to hear future episodes. And again, feel free to check out Philosophy and Faith and Pretty Good Servants, our other podcasts. Bye now.